May all that you stand for and that we stand for be preserved under the providence of God for the happiness of mankind. The trouble is caused by unthinking people who carelessly throw away ageless ideals as if they were old and outworn machines. But it is the values of individual liberty, equality before the law and the supremacy of people over the state to which we can always with confidence return as a powerful and uniting force. Australia is not a secular country, it is a free country. Good evening and welcome to Apollo Talk. Tonight, I talk your info. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, this is so silly. Oh, I can't understand anybody when they're wearing those things. But I don't even know how they don't laugh at themselves. It's so ridiculously funny. Ah, oh, welcome to the show. Uh, tonight you get to run the show because we haven't actually planned anything serious. Um, but uh, during joining me tonight is Alexandra Marshall and Damien Curie. Uh, welcome to the show, guys. How are you? Hi. I suggest that all mainstream news journalists should start wearing masks when they do their broadcasts. It would dramatically improve news broadcasting in Australia. Well, let's just write something more uh, meaningful, you know. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, uh, we'll wear it in meaningful <laughs> ways, like the chin chin bra, um, and the uh, the muzzle. Um, Location as I actually well. had my Hopefully. first experience today getting into trouble. Oh, really? From the lady at, yes, from the lady at the post office. Oh, and uh, what did she have to say? She asked me why I wasn't wearing a mask. And did you tell and her? I said I left it in the car. And oh, really? She said, well, I can refuse your service. And I said, well, I guess you can. And uh, then I politely suggested that the game was over and the tide has turned and public have woken up to it and et cetera, et cetera. Did you so, accuse her of being a lieutenant in a Nazi fascist state or? No, well, I thought that. I did suggest that maybe she she look at the science, but, of course, I got the, you know, I think she thought I was going to start, you know, reciting science that may be somewhat questionable to her. We should take the same. We should take the same approach as Extinction Rebellion does where you're so crazy that no one refuses to obey you because they don't want a scene. Yeah, I think she was scared. I think by the end of it, they were kind of just happy to serve me and get me out the door. You know? That's <laughs> I how often get my best that, service. Damien, just, get my best just, service gonna, just gonna move you along, that's all. Have no that's trouble. Right. Exactly. I, <laughs> I have never, ever been bothered for not wearing a mask um, by anybody. Uh, Do you the, wear the it one like that, Damien? No, now, Dave, I, do you wear it like that with the off the ear loop thing you've got going on? Because that's uh... I I um, never have uh, uh, <laughs> gidgets already onto it. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I have a lawful exception, and uh, I've never been asked if I have a lawful exception. People just don't even look at me. I'm, I'm actually, I don't know. I'm more willing to make eye contact than than most people. Other close friends I have are not willing to. Uh, use the lawful exceptions that are there um, in the Queensland Chief Health Officer's uh, directions um, because they just don't want to get awkward looks and everything. I'm like, I think it's fun. Um, there's all these people walking around um, breathing in old bacteria and recycled carbon dioxide and, and, and they, uh, I don't know, they look quite uncomfortable and, and awkward. Maybe they're afraid of me. Um, dirty anti-vaxxer! Get off the street. Yeah. Shall, uh, well, we, uh, shall we skip to the real news of today, which is the uh, revelation by Dr. Chart, uh, New South Wales' chief health officer, that we are living in... That video, Matt. Yeah, that we're living in the new world order. Mm. Let's hear her. Okay, Turn it up. That, but this is very much... Will exposure sites be put back in place, especially with reopening and people going back to pubs and stuff? Because Are exposure sites still... 
will they be put back in place to be listed once we are reopening? Because they're not at the moment. Um, we will be looking at what contact tracing looks like in the new world order. And yes, it will be pubs and clubs and other things if we have a positive case there. The new world order <laughs> and the anti-vaxxers conspiracy theorists across the globe were electrified and switched on suddenly. <laughs> Is that the QAnon really new happening. world order that they were talking about? <laughs> I, I think we need to release a line, a competing lines of merch, Ellie, uh, framed around the new world order. See who can see who can uh, design the best and sell the most, and uh, donate the profits to each other. Yeah, I was going to say not charity, but uh, <laughs> Damien could Damien could come up with a, a new shirt for us, a, a new world order shirt, and wear it. Well, I'm wearing my Ai Weiwei T-shirt, which is which I bought in Hong Kong before I left. Um, and uh, Sweet. yeah, he uh, he's and, the uh, and for me, I have no idea. Oh, yeah. Who is that? So Ai Weiwei is uh, a dissident um, artist and uh, poet author, artist, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, he, uh, he's he been jailed by um, the Communist Party regime in China. Um, there was uh, a big display of some of his work um, in in Australia in uh, at the uh, Asia Pacific Triennial uh, Art Exhibition, which happens every three years in at the Queensland Art Gallery in Brisbane. Um, so he's a, he's a well-known in, in art circles, uh, in the Asia, right across the Asia Pacific region. He's a fantastic artist, but, um, uh, you know, a political activist and someone who speaks out or spoke out bravely against uh, Beijing uh, and the Communist Party, who's actually from China and lives in mainland China, which is a pretty big deal. Um, and they and they won't touch him because he, um, I think he won the Nobel Peace Prize or was nominated oh, really? for the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah, I better check that. But, um, but yeah, he he. Uh, so you know, you wouldn't think you'd have to wear that, a t-shirt like that in Australia, but that's where we're at. And when you hear these people speak, what we're yeah. dealing with here, I think, is this petty bureaucrats gone mad. I mean, the psychology of these people is, is, is. Well, out you're, of control. you're totally right. Everyone knows that the most tyrannical people you ever come across are in the hospital system. Doctors and nurses, not all of them, but a lot of them have a sort of superiority slash god complex going on. And uh, they're in charge of their own little universe. And what's happened is we've mixed bureaucrats with medical dictators and given them free reign over the entirety of society. And now we know why the left has been so keen for universal mm -hmm. health care, because clearly the second you give medical practitioners rule over the civilization, you get communism. Pretty much within 18 months, we've gone from democracy to full-blown communism. And even China's like, bro, we, we didn't do that. Like, that's how far Australia yep. has come. Yep. Uh, and I had a topic, I don't know if you boys have seen it, but I want to talk about white, like white supremacy and colonial oppression because our government has sent the army to remote Indigenous communities to basically vaccinate them almost by force where they've gone over there and um, the Indigenous people are saying they don't really want to be vaccinated, but they've sent the army there to do it. What do you guys think about that as far as... Uh, a bit of white man oppression. Uh, white, well, I think it's white savior, isn't it? Doing their usual thing, isn't it? You know, we, we'll take care of you. We know best. Um, you need us. Uh, patronize, patronize, and then they accuse everyone else of running a patriarchy. It's uh, hilarious hypocrisy to the nth degree. David, well, let it us is. save it... you. Let us save you, remote indigenous communities. That's essentially what they've gone and done. And it's so consistent. I mean, th these are the people who complain about imperialism um, and, and patriarchy and this imposition of culture and ideas. Uh, th th there's so much hypocrisy. It just gets absolutely exhausting. Uh, you know, Ellie, you're talking about uh, the medical authoritarianism, medical tyranny that, that's going on. Um, we have the authoritarians can't even call them left and right at the moment because there's plenty on the alleged right of center who are authoritarian uh and excuse me and they uh are saying look you have to trust the science but in the meantime uh the apra the regulating body for doctors and uh medical science professionals in australia refuses 
to allow any dissent or debate of the science. If a doctor questions it, uh, if a doctor questions uh, abortion or vaccine protocols, then they are absolutely shut down and risk being deregistered. Uh, I know one doctor who was forced to go through re-education because they were deemed to be a potential risk to their patients after a complaint from a person not even living in Australia, not a patient who had suffered, not a patient, not even an Australian. Uh, and that is how silenced and censored and muzzled our medical science professionals are in Australia. Trust the science. We're not even letting scientists talk. I'm not going to trust the science you shove down my throat, bureaucracy. Well, trust the science. Trust the science is just basically a slippery slope to authoritarianism because uh, science without morals and ethics leads you into pretty dodgy places, which is why you never just blindly follow scientific outcomes because you have to overlay them with what not what you do, not what you can do, but what you should do and what's right to be done as well, yep. not just technical possibilities. But I have a question for you boys, and I don't know if you've seen it yet because it's pretty new today. Um, you might start with uh, Damien. Um, the Indian Bar Association is charging the World Health Organization scientist, I'm going to screw this name up, uh, Somya Swamthan, I don't know, uh, for mass murder. They're accusing her of causing mass deaths of Indians by misleading them about ivermectin, which she said oh, okay doesn't work against COVID-19. And as a result, ivermectin was stopped and the outbreaks increased and deaths increased tenfold. Oh, I thought and that so, story was going to go the other way. No, it didn't. So the so just to be clear, the Indian Bar is suing the World Health Organization scientist for mass murder for wow. restricting the use of ivermectin. Wow. Good. That's big. Well, look, I mean, th there's a lot to be... The, the whole ivermectin thing, as you know, has been very contentious and there's a lot to be said about um the fact that there are still studies ongoing into ivermectin um <clears throat> oxford's doing one a new one um there have been a number of studies that have been done that unfortunately have not shown widespread efficacy or have been uh, in in terms of ivermectin being used with different drugs um but we have had in the developing world we've seen these declines where where ivermectin's been used there's been these declines so, you know, this is why they're still studying it, still trying to work out what's going on there. Here's, um, here's one of those graphs uh, in Africa. The um, I need to try and fix that tab just a little I bit. I haven't seen this well, I, this I don't is, know uh, how many people are aware, but as Damien says, it's being used off-label in Asia, in South America, yeah. uh, and in Africa. And there's a lot of groups that have got together, a lot of doctors, associations who swear blind that they have seen the benefits of ivermectin in their patients. And they've yeah, actually come oh, yeah, and said yeah, it's, oh, very, yeah. it's very difficult to run testing anymore and trials because the use of ivermectin is so high now that they can't find patients who haven't used it. Wow. In a lot well, of have this, um, have a look at this graph. Down the bottom, you've got the, got the blue, blue line, line, which is uh, not a border on the graphic. It's it's the actual um, line of of uh, fatalities per hundred thousand people who live in in countries with um, with ivermectin. That's the the countries in the middle half of of Africa. The top quarter and the bottom quarter are non-ivermectin using countries where the use of ivermectin is common as an anti-parasitic uh, drug. And in those countries where they don't routinely use ivermectin uh, just throughout the natural population, the, the peaks and troughs of uh, COVID deaths per 100,000 people is immense. It's just you know 10 to 20 times more than the nations that routinely use ivermectin. I... I don't even I don't take the government seriously until they're going to start talking about off patent pharmaceuticals and the discussions that we need to be having with our GPS to find uh, you know therapies preventative and and early treatment protocols um, for people diagnosed with with covid um, I don't take them seriously that they care about covid or they care about covid deaths I just they're liars absolute liars the, the vaccine yeah. is hard to find source and roll out but these things, uh, decades old with decades of safety data for off-label use. They're off-patent, so they're cheap. They don't even need to cost the taxpayer anything 
you can get a month supply for like 20 bucks. Uh, and when you take it made for humans and supervised and prescribed by a doctor, uh, there's <laughs> complete relative safety uh, compared to the things we're busting a gut for and failing to roll out in a timely manner. I just well, the good news, the good news, Dave, is that you can get it. Um, Greg Hunt, the federal health minister, has said that doctors are entitled to prescribe it off label, right? And that they can't be stopped by AHPRA for that. Um, so it is perfectly okay for a doctor to prescribe ivermectin off label for uh, COVID nineteen, and there are doctors out there doing the triple. Th so they, they usually prescribe it with zinc and a and an antibiotic. Yeah. Um, yep. That, and I'm not a doctor, so don't take my word for it. But go and talk <coughs> to your doctor. But you, there are doctors out there that will look at prescribing it for people um, who yep. are concerned. Um, and it is incredibly cheap. Uh, I know that the Indian government were preparing blister packs of ivermectin with other drugs and handing them out for free um, wow. instead of doing the vac because the vaccination was too, too, a too expensive alternative for them. Yep. Um, so look, you know, if there is this, this Damien, are you an anti-vaxxer? Me? No, I'm far from it. Much to the, can't you see the needle sticking out of the back of his neck? I mean, I thought it was obvious. My next Sorry? question was, are you a racist? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I'm well, double vaxxed. I'm, I'm all there. I'm done. I, I'm cooked. I'd like to know no, how, how Sarah Hansen Young, sorry, Senator Sarah Hansen Young, thinks she can use uh, discussions and information about ivermectin that Sky News was engaging in as part of their opinion pieces as an excuse to take them off air uh, because they've apparently spread false information by even having the discussion about these drugs when they're being used all across the world. They're part. The World Health Organization in March made them made ivermectin now officially part of COVID trials because of the the use around the world, and so this this inquiry into media diversity is trying to say that if you talk about ivermectin or anything at all that the either Therapeutic Goods Association or the government says you can't, then they're going to try and use that to take down news broadcasting uh, as some kind of violation of media terms. I mean that has to be scary when. If the media isn't free to debate or disagree with government health orders or the opinions of politicians, then can no. we really call it the free press? Well, it's it's really important to understand, Alexandra, that uh, science is strictly the domain of left-wing philosophies. Um, and as are facts uh, and encyclopedias, in fact, even dictionaries are strictly the property and domain of left-wing politicians. It's very important that you never <laughs> ever criticize, uh, question, or you know, critique, review, compare information of any kind of left-wing source at all because they are the only scientists that exist. Anybody that disagrees with them is clearly not a science and therefore you're anti-science. It's, it's uh, Sarah Hansen Young's exactly right. We need to look. Honestly, I mean, that Sarah Hansen Young is even in our parliament um, makes me want to sort of bang my head against a brick wall. The woman is not intelligent. I'm sorry. She lacks a, uh, a sense of morals and ethics around free speech, which is clear. Um, and, you know, to, to what annoys me the most about the Greens is, apart from the fact that they absolutely lie to everyone that they're an environmental party when they're actually a left-wing neo-Marxist party, um, I mean, I'd be quite happy if they just came out and said we're a left-wing neo-Marxist party rather than saying we're environmental and, you know, you, you right, liberal just voters who drive SUVs that want to feel good about it <clears throat> for five seconds can vote one Green. Forget it. These people are the far left in Australia. And they're dangerous, very dangerous, because they would be very happy to regulate you to within an inch of your life. And they'd be very yep. happy to regulate you, every word that comes out of your mouth, everything you're allowed to say, everything you're allowed to do. And they're tyrannical and they're mean and they look all nice and sweet and they probably got their herbal oils going and, um, you know, go to yoga class every week and, uh, you know, meditate daily, but they'll kill you if you don't do everything <laughs> that they say. And I mean that. I mean, this is the personality type that we're dealing with. We're dealing with yeah. really horrible, horrible people dressed up in a sort of a you know beautiful coating and that yep. defines totalitarian authoritarian and communist governments and if you look at yep. china you turn on cctv the, the state television network which i think runs all the channels 
and you get these beautiful images of nature and trickling in this beautiful, soft, relaxing music. And everybody stay calm. And if anybody protests or anybody says anything that contradicts, they just politely say, oh, we just want to keep the calm. We just want everything yep. to be, you know, other, other states should mind their own business and we should all be nice and calm. Is, is and this the, the China where more than half of its water isn't fit for human contact, let alone consumption? This is the Con China with the contact. Wow. Not consumption, contact. You can't touch it. It's that wow. toxic. Sounds like the yeah. yarrow. Yeah. So communism isn't great for the environment if we're going to be really clear here. But just on Sarah Hansen Young, just before we go, I'm not sure how many of you sat for the trial. And I did. I had to watch it because obviously I work for a news organization. So I had to go and, and have a look. And at one stage there, I endured an hour where Sarah Hansen Young was interviewing Kevin Rudd, which ranks as one of the lowest moments of my life. But before that, she was interviewing Whitaker, obviously the boss of Sky News Australia. And she started going on about how the Sky News Australian hosts were racist, but also sexist. And then literally five minutes later, she started asking Whitaker how many of his producers were female and how old they were. And then used that to say that there was clearly a power imbalance because young female staff are unable to do their jobs because of the male uh, host. So obviously, if you're a young girl, you are incapable of doing your doing your job at all. And I think that's a little bit sexist, a bit ageist uh, too. Uh, Just a so, teensy bit of cognitive dissonance in the logic there. But, hey, yeah. it's the left we're talking about, so they'll just yeah, carry on me. with their massive this, hypocrisy. And, and it's, you can't let this go because I'm the only one who noticed it. But there was a moment there where um, Sarah Hansen young asked the chief bureaucrat in charge of, uh, you know, the news broadcasting standards, what she actually did, and there was silence. Because when you ask the bureaucracy what they actually do, they don't have a clue. It was brilliant. I, I wish I had it recorded. <laughs> Just dead silence. What do you do? I, I don't know. Oh, that's no funny. Idea. Let's pull up some comments board. from the I'm going to do anything. <laughs> what do you mean? I need a job. I don't have a job. <laughs> Let's pull up some comments from the audience. This is the Ask Us Anything episode of Pillow Talk. It's what we do when we haven't had time to actually plan an episode content or clips for you, and uh, it makes us look like we're organised and on top of it and just really interested in, in what you have to say, because we are. So please ask your questions now. There's a bunch that will, will come first, and uh, we won't get to everyone, but it would be great to be spoilt for choice. Um, so Matt, our producer, is actually going to surprise us with questions without notice. Uh, hopefully he puts up the ones that Christina Keneally will describe as cavalcades of racism and intolerance and and other such wonderful promotions as she gives the CPAC conference each year. Uh, so we have the very lovely, lovely channel says, hi Dave, with vaccine passports inevitable, does anyone have any credible way of getting exemptions? Medical exemption is close to impossible, religious exemption won't be feasible either. Um, well, you have to have an honest conversation with your doctor. I know a doctor and you might need to look around for a doctor who is pro-science uh, and uh, willing anti-tyranny. Um, if you can find a doctor who believes in, um, uh, what's that thing called again? Oh, that's right, informed consent. Um, they might be able to uh, help you, you know, pursue the greater good instead of um, taking, ticking a technical box. Ellie, Damien, do either of you have thoughts on, on um, the very lovely channel's question? Let Ellie go first. Uh, mine's a pitchfork. That's the, uh, it's the only credible exemption that I know about. A pitchfork? Oh, as in show people you've already been stabbed, stab yourself with a pitchfork? No, as in like a literal pitchfork. I'm going to go home to the farm and get one from the shed, which we use for hay, and I'm going to bring that to Sydney, and that could be my exemption. I don't know how that works, Ellie. <laughs> She's gonna I stick it in you. I'm a peasant. You do I'm gonna <laughs> give me credit. So Put your mask friend. back on, Dave. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, wear it how you were wearing it before the rest oh. of the company arrived. Put it back on how it's supposed to be worn. In loving memory of John Cornell. There you go. Thank there you, you go. That's what we all agreed <laughs> was gonna be how Dave wears his mask. You answer the question now, Damien. You've had plenty of time to uh, to think of an answer. Uh, we can't let it happen. We simply cannot let this happen. There is yeah. simply zero scientific or political or social benefit or any justification whatsoever 
for vaccine passports. Whether I'm vaccinated or not, uh, and I am vaccinated, I have no right to demand anybody else be vaccinated. I mean, it's absurd that we're even 100%. having this debate in this country, and yep. it just shows how far we've fallen that we think it's okay to go around sticking needles in people against their will. Um, now, as for a restricting... <laughs> I'm, I'm going off on a serious one of my serious rants. I'm sorry, I can't. How am I supposed to keep it together? I can't together keep my train of thought if you're going to. I'm trying to work out who you look like. <laughs> Benny Hill? Why Benny Hill? Why am I getting Benny Hill? I've no idea. There aren't anyway. a lot of albinos with moustaches to pick from. Do you, I think this is the left strategy is that I've noticed that we've gotten sort of more insane over the past few months. I think the. <laughs> I think the left strategy just to drive everyone completely nuts is working. Although well, Dave's kind of clearly cracked. On. He was the There's first to go. People are now he's up. in a horror film. He looks like, what's that Bird Box film? That one where she was on the cover with like a blindfold? <laughs> this is the white supremacy <laughs> version of Bird Box. <laughs> Bird Box. I have no idea what that means. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a sufficient white supremacist, obviously, if it's a white supremacist movie. Um, you need five of them for that. You'll put one all around. <laughs> I know. Okay, so maybe, anyway, I'm say, really maximise the. Maybe, maybe you can comment on this. I, I accidentally put something up that upset uh, Twitter the other day, which is easy to do. To be fair, it's gone viral though. I said I made these statements. I want to see what you think about them. I said COVID nineteen vaccination does not stop infection. COVID nineteen vaccination does not stop transmission. COVID vaccination does not create herd immunity. COVID vaccination does not lead to eradication. This is from the CDC. And then I said there is no scientific basis for mandatory vaccination or vaccine passports. Now, they actually changed their warnings because they couldn't decide if I was misleading or wrong. They've settled on misleading because obviously I was quoting the CDC, so they can't exactly get rid of it. But that has been considered not allowed to be liked or reblogged on Twitter but it's factually correct. So I was wondering, yeah. uh, are they frightened of the truth? Because the truth is these vaccinations don't create herd immunity because they don't rob the virus of hosts. <clears throat> because while ever a virus is able to infect and transmit between carriers, it can't create herd immunity and you cannot eradicate the virus. Look yep. at Israel, perfect proof. The only the thing the vaccine does is it reduces the level of, of illness. If you look at the chart from Israel and you see now you've got the infection rate going through the roof because everyone's going to get infected by Delta. The current, the consensus, the latest consensus, and I'm doing this in detail on the uh, episode 62 of The Other Side, which will be out on Saturday, um, but we've covered in, in a fair bit of detail um, the, the latest science around this. And it, it, it appears that the consensus now is moving towards that everybody's going to get Delta. It's that infectious, which is fine because it's not that deadly. Um, if you've been vaccinated, however, you will not suffer as badly. You've got to weigh up the risks of vaccination, of course, and that should be everybody's individual choice. Um, but the charts from Israel, which are showing that, okay, they're at this point where, you know, just about everyone's been vaccinated. Everyone's getting the thing. Um, but the deaths are going like this. So let me, put this let me put this to you, Damien, just so you've got a contrast here. We all know about Sweden. So the, because Sweden didn't impose restrictions in the first wave, a significant portion of Swedes have natural immunity because they are exposed to the virus when other countries weren't, right? We know that. They didn't put lockdowns on. And we're now seeing in every piece of study of data that transmissions are stopping and infections are stopping because, as we know from Israel, this is, an, this is a study published by the CDC, natural immunity is up to 14 times more resistant to infection than a vaccine. Yep. So yeah, they got their deaths the out of the way early, and now it looks like they might even be uh, moving toward eradication because they're gaining real herd immunity. Now, the people who take the vaccine, as we know, doesn't grant you herd immunity, and it doesn't seem to stop you from getting infection in any meaningful way. So we've got two systems now yeah. where one is heading toward herd immunity and possibly eradication, and another is locking itself in continuous cycles of variance. Now, the total death toll between those two we see that Sweden is slipping further and further back down toward the lower death toll because, as I said, it's the transmission isn't coming. And now they've locked Israel out of their travel because they don't want them to bring more and more infected people in from Israel into a population of herd immunity. So what, what's that contrast? You don't hear anybody talk about two distinct 
ways of handling the future of this virus? Well, I think we will hear about, I mean, look, we were saying this last year, you know, that herd immunity, sorry, not herd immunity, natural immunity would be well, no, more that, effective than, yeah. than a vaccine. It usually is. And, you know, that's probably no great shock um, to anyone, but it's good uh, because it means that, you know, obviously if everybody gets it, then we're all going to be immune pretty quickly. And that's how we're going to come out of this thing. Um, I think though, that if you want to prevent the illness and you don't want to get terribly sick or you're in a, you know, you're in a, you're in a high risk group or you just like, like me are a bit of a scaredy cat when it comes to flus. Um, but I'm also a scaredy cat when it comes to <laughs> vaccines. So I had to do a bit of, <laughs> a bit of deciding, um, you know, you just make your own mind up as grown adults. And I think what the Swedes did was they treated their populace like grown adults. And they said, look, try to stay at home, try to socially distance, wear a mask if you want to. But there were no police on the streets with fines. Therefore, mm. there were no protests. Therefore, there were no arrests. Therefore, there were no mega fines. I mean, we're living in a... I mean, Australia was already becoming a nanny state before this, right? And I think this is kind of good in a way because it's brought it all up to the point where everyone's just going, okay, this is ridiculous. Well and I think we're seeing now the need that we, I said on the show this week that we might need to look at constitutional changes to protect our liberty from nut job bureaucrats because we've got these middle management, I mean, let's face it. I mean, these premiers, God, they aren't the cream of the crop. The problem is so many people in Australia are craving control. They're really enjoying state slavery. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how you would get a constitution change. Um, we can, we can, uh, Vancouver, when they lifted all health restrictions, the people protest freedom. Well, like, this is the mentality oh. in the West. It's just we've got this, this absolute. Uh, all, it doesn't all surprise me about Canadians. All I'm saying anyway. is that we've got, we've been presented with two futures. One is infinite every four to six month booster shots for new variants because your own immune system has been suppressed. So you're not as likely to uh, be able to fight off random things. So you've got infinite lockdowns and infinite booster shots, or you have a, a hard task for the first few months and then a future without the, the vaccinations because you've got natural herd immunity. And that's what Sweden has gone for. That looks like a real future to me, a return to actual normal. But as we heard from Dr. Carrie Chant, she's more interested in the, the new world order and the new normal and build back better. And they love the idea that we've become drug addicts to the international bureaucracy that's unelected. And that just worries me that we're never going to get, we're all dependent now on the World Health Organization and a, a few billion dollar companies that are profiting from basically tyranny. Yeah, and that's because they're the experts who are unelected, so they love it when we're, you know, we're, we're hostage to them. Um, yeah, I mean, we're talking, you, you raised the point about the medical profession being a little bit dictatorial in its style anyway. Um, newsrooms were like that for journalism. Um, there are chefs and kitchens, you know, anywhere where you've got to produce an output under pressure. Uh, you know, a news bulletin or a meal or, uh, or you've got to do medicine, which is much more serious, I guess, than, than any of that. But um, so you do tend to get these hierarchies of power and very authoritarian, dictatorial kind of personality types emerge. Um, and in, in management, that's sort of a known phenomenon. You also get it quite a lot, ironically, in the arts, um, in theatre, in dance, um, and, and in sometimes, it, it, I mean, sometimes in sport, but sport tends to be more collegiate, more team oriented um, in some ways. So, um, you know, that style of management, it's not surprising mm. that we're seeing that. Um, and I think it's really important that we take note of that because that can't really be allowed to continue. Um, the other place you get it, of course, is in the police service where you need those types of people. And that's sort of, the type, the personality types attracted to policing yep. uh, are people who want to enforce rules and, and that works because that's their job, but it has to be restrained by the bureaucracy and the leadership and the political leadership um, so that you don't wind up with, with sort of a tyrannical um, execution of, uh, of, of police orders and things. So we're in a pretty precarious <laughs> situation, I think, in Australia where we've got these, as I was about to say before, fairly... Um, intellectually low-level people uh, because of our political system and the failings of our two major political parties to get talent to the top. 
Um, they don't seek talent. They don't look for talent. They push talent away because the incumbents don't want to be threatened. It's like any business, except in a business, if you don't get the talent to the top, you go out of business. These guys will just continue to do this uh, in this two-party system forever. The Greens have made some inroads on the on the left. We're now going to see, I think, massive voting for the minor parties on the right. There is so much anger, frustration and dissatisfaction with the lack of leadership we've seen from Scott Morrison. Um, you know, a year ago on, on the lack other of side, leadership. a lot of other commentators were willing to give I, him a break. I, but I don't know that it's... Set up now. I don't know that it's fair to call it a, a lack of leadership. Um, he's leading the business community to become active discriminators against the great unwashed. Um, I, I use the term Morrison's deplorables. Uh, he's taking sides very clearly and he's, he's leading the charge. Um, I had a federal MP tell me this week that uh, vaccine passports aren't government policy. Meanwhile, the leader of the federal government uh, is out there helping states access the vaccine database, the vaccine register, and integrate it with uh, check-in apps. He's telling businesses that they have every right under property law to go ahead and, and you know, just basically encouraging them and smoothing the way for them and, and uh, not in the least bit condemning or critical. I think he's providing marvellous leadership for the authoritarians in, in the nation. He is allergic, he's allergic to responsibility, which is why he's got his national cabinet. That, it's it, also Kelly, why, yeah. it's yeah. also why uh, when it was ruled that they'd have to give up their secrecy because they weren't a real cabinet, because he's just wrong. He, he was inept and set up something that wasn't as illegally restrictive as he hoped. His first instinct was instead of to obey the law that's there, he moved to change the law by yep. issuing a bill so that he could keep his secrecy despite the court ruling. But on Barilara, I just remembered, I, I have a quote from Barilara about his uh, vaccine passports. I'm just scrolling it uh, down to it because it was pretty funny. He basically came out to deny the fact that there was anything called a vaccine passport. And this is what he said. Oh, dear. It, it's, it's worth reading. Uh, at no point did we say that there would be a vaccine passport for what other freedoms we have been given in September. Police will be, well you will still have to prove your vaccination, but it's not the vaccination passport that we're doing the work through for at Service New South Wales. So you'll have the ability to download the app from Medicare, which is your immunisation records, on your MyGov app. That's the proof. You've got to be able to prove that you're vaccinated. That's actually part of the conditions of having those freedoms, that you've got to be able to prove that you're vaccinated if you're pulled up by police. Let's not confuse the issue here. That's, no, that's a direct no. point from Barilaro. Let's not get confused. This is definitely not a vaccine passport. This is a port pass seen back. That's definitely not a vaccine passport. It's it's no. close, it's similar, but it's not a vaccine passport. Uh, and just and not, before we move on, because I've got a question there, but uh, this is a quote from Kerry Chart that you guys might have missed. She said, I think I've talked about my aspirational dream of us being the most vaccinated country. We've always got choices. And for me, the choice is follow the public health orders and get vaccinated. That's that's Kerry Chant from the New World Order speaking You've to us. You've always got the choices the within the bounds of the two things or one thing that we're going to permit you to choose from. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Classic. Yeah. We're going to take some questions, questions, Dave. Pull up some questions and make Damien read them. This Annette, is uh, good. Annette says, I a whole a lot from the move through through government today with some propaganda encouraging me to get the vaccine. <sighs> How's my best way to respond because I don't want it? Annette, I would write back and say, please advise me how I don't get the vaccine and, you know, what what you'll be doing to protect my freedoms. Ask questions back. That's what yep. I always do. Yeah, love it. No, that's real good. Uh, next question. Matt, you're in charge. Spin the wheel, like roll the barrel. Matt doesn't have one. He's like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Um. I was well, uh, advising somebody how to talk to a federal MP today and uh, I was saying, look, the, the best question to ask him with no words that he can wiggle, you know, and pivot off, like if you choose the wrong word, is do you agree with Scott Morrison's words on vaccine passports? Um, just do you agree with what Scott Morrison is saying about vaccine passports. Uh, don't ask him. Yeah, and that's just, it's its going to be a simple yes or no. Um, and if they say no, then don't vote for him. 
uh, sorry, if they say yes, then don't vote for them um, because it's Just a sort of tyranny. Read your prompt, Dave. Um, this one's for you. Given the vaccinated oh. seem to be so scared of the unvaccinated, Andrew Dowling asks, given the vaccinated seem to be so scared of the unvaccinated, as you said in your article, Ellie, they will uh, walk into oncoming traffic to avoid a pedestrian on the footpath. Perhaps the solution is for them to stay, for them to stay in, quar in quarantine indefinitely for their protection. Thoughts? I've said from the very beginning that before this all happened, we lived in a free country. So if you want to put yourself under house arrest forever, you can do that. You can stay inside. No one's going to come and make you come outside. If you want to wear a mask forever and if you want to do three masks and a face shield, which I've seen recently, you can you can do that. If you want to wear a full three hazmat masks suit. Three masks and a face shield. If you want to, if you want to uh, right. wear a hazmat suit to get a cup of coffee, I'm sure you'd still get served, maybe with a weird, can you just stop that, Dave? You look so freaking strange. Um, so my opinion is that free will should have been enough for this. For those who are frightened, stay inside and let everybody else go out. And the reason they're not going to do it, like this is the reason they will not let that happen. Because in a free society, people aren't as afraid as they want them to be. And as soon as lots of people go outside without restrictions and the world doesn't end, then the propaganda falls apart. And you can't lie in the face of overwhelming evidence. And that's the problem. Because if these health mandates are proved to be false, and this is why they pressured Sweden before and they dropped yeah. the money, if you've, got a, if you've got a test case that can compare it to and it proves to be incorrect, you become legally responsible for human rights violations and they do not want that to happen. Well, they, they, they're they already responsible for human rights violations. I, yeah, I, I it is, hey, it just, well, um, can I tell you something that somebody sent me today? I don't know. Can, can I, I can't share a, uh, I'm just trying to think how I can share this document with you. Uh, but, can um, you send it, you can either email it or put a link in the private chat for the producer. I can send group. it in the private chat. Hang on a sec. Let me it's do that. A link. Yeah. This is well, a while you're doing that, I've, just got, I've got a comment here from one of the people who we asked to write in. Put that mask down, Dave. I can feel you doing stuff with it. Um, it's One person says, this is Shiva. How can we dissolve parliament and replace our dictators with someone decent? That's more of a, rhetor a rhetorical question, I presume, but I'm guessing elections, minor parties. Yes. 100%. Um, the, look, the serious workable strategy, I think, um, I'm running with as my number one strategy. There are some more extreme ones that are available to you. Um, but the, the number one is working from the bottom of your ballot. We, we basically need to stop thinking about preferential voting as endorsement voting it's your your list of preferences and and so you know you you need to basically think of them as a, a kick in the shins a pinch on the arm uh, a slap on the face a a you know slap on the back and and a staple in the forehead um, and then you need to preference those things and you're not going to like any of them but start from the bottom and work your way up. So on the bottom, you're going to put all the radical leftists like the Greens uh, and then Labour Liberal, you know, second and third from the bottom. I'm not sure which one is the most authoritarian. Uh, but then all your first preferences should go to right of centre, minor and independent um, conservatives and classical liberals and libertarians and basically put all the people who believe in small government and freedom and human rights at the top. The best case scenario is we end up with a strong crossbench in the Senate, in the upper house of the federal parliament, and possibly also in the, in, in the lower house as well. So we're not gonna get rid of the major parties, but there's a chance we could steal the balance of power from them. Well, let's explain why that's important because I get asked this all the time and people say, oh, won't that just mean we end up with, uh, you know, a scattering of minor parties and no major party? The point of the Westminster system, and this is really crucial, is minor parties don't exist to hold power, although occasionally a minor party will replace a major party, but it's rare. Minor mm. parties exist that when the two major parties start voting the same and become essentially a mono party, you stack the House and the Senate 
with minor parties so that the major parties can't do anything. It's the equivalent of throwing something in the engine to stop it. And once you stop the engine, first of all, you stop them passing tyrannous laws without anyone overseeing them at all. You basically stop everything that's going on and it forces the major parties to sit down and either negotiate with the people who are a centre and centre-right or to come back and reform their own parties and to find some more differentiation between the two. It's crucial that we go through the process of stopping the entire parliament so that we get off this slippery slope of destruction and then start reworking our political structure. The only other alternative that happens, historically speaking, is once a major party falls off its philosophical heights, it then yep. gets reformed either from itself or from another minor party growing to replace it. Yep. And, you know, this all takes time. It's going to be a nightmare. Are you done now, Damien? Have you got your, your thing no, done? No, I can't share it. I can't, I can't actually share it. But what it is is a letter from Scott Morrison um, that was sent to a friend of a friend of a friend. Uh, I have an original screenshot of the letter, so I validated it. It's, it's absolutely 100% real. But in it, it talks about, it's a response to a letter from this person saying, look, can you uh, talk to, tell us how the, the COVID-19 vaccination certificate is going to be used? Is it going to be used as some kind of passport? And are we creating a two-tier Australia here of the vaccinated and the unvaccinated? And in the last few paragraphs of this letter, there's a whole lot of waffle in the response at the front about how you know brilliantly the government's handling all of this. And then it says, um, because of the evidence of the ability of vaccines to prevent transmission of COVID-19, we have an opportunity to further consider safely relaxing restrictions once we get a high rate of vaccination. This will require us to reassure the community that people are fully vaccinated. To support verification of vaccination status, Services Australia has developed a COVID-19 digital certificate for people who have received all the required doses of COVID-19 vaccine. And you can put it in your Apple wallet. I've got mine already. Um, the digi- I can show it to you. Can I have a screen? The digital certificate is available now through MyGov and Medicare Online or uh, from your immunisation provider. Here's the good bit. It is not a passport, in quotation marks. <laughs> it is a formal reward of your vaccination. A reward. Oh, my God. I'm sticker. sorry, but if you tick. think, what are we hey, For all those Karens and Darrens out there that love a little, love a little bit of a gold star for their good behaviour. I mean, we're treating adults like five-year-olds handing them lollipops for getting a vaccination. I mean, the, the protection's supposed to be of your your reward for getting a vaccination. That's no, it. You're not supposed to... You don't go and take away... You look like a, you look like you've gone Jewish on us, Dave. Like, do you realise that you look like Jewish? I was, I was I was going for Bondi Surf Lifesaver. Um, <laughs> in the, the David Hasselhoff look. It's, you know, David, David. Oh, my God. Sorry, I just realised the last paragraph of this letter is worse than anything. Let me read, read the that. last paragraph. Read that. Hang on. While before you want get to it, achieve the get... highest rate of vaccination possible, it will not be compulsory to have the vaccine. The government is clear that vaccination is a personal choice. Options to verify a person's vaccination status will not change this position. Okay. So, <laughs> Thank are you for writing to me. You're sincerely honourable Scott you down, Morrison, you? temporary prime minister. Temporary. temporary. I mean, basically it's, saying uh, I, voluntary I is not going to get you. I, I personally you am greatly comforted by uh, the prime minister's sincere and integrous assurances that uh, we will not be having a vaccine passport. I am thrilled that in the grand vision he has for our liberal, inclusive, uh, pluralistic democracy of egalitarian equity for every single Australian, we will instead be going for a social credit system. Well, I pointed out that if we're going, if we don't have access to public transport, to shops, to our jobs, to travel, then why do we have to pay tax? Because our taxes pay for those services. So I'm trying to struggle. Where's their argument for us paying tax? I think um, it's better to, rather than stop taxing people, I mean, tax them a bit more because that's what the Liberal Party does. Uh, And what we need to do is set up an entirely new and parallel education system uh, and public transport and public health. Um, I mean, we could just have the unvaccinated sit at the back of the bus, I guess. Um, but, you know, we, we definitely need 
different schools and, and hospitals and cafes and restaurants for the under What a great segue into one of our impromptu topics, Dave, which I've sent Matt, your sort of live-in uh, slave, in the in the comments. The new, <laughs> the new Facebook group of businesses in Australia banding together to reject discrimination, to reject segregation. They have stated in this group that they will not be asking for your vaccination status and they will, there's a little link there to the Facebook group itself, and they will serve all customers. And so it shows you that there is still some people who refuse to engage in discrimination, even yeah. if the government tells them to. And, I think there's uh, a massive they, marketing opportunity there for anybody. Cafes, yeah. well, any the, business that wants to say, hey, we're not going to discriminate. We don't, we don't ask. We won't ask you your vaccination status. We won't ask you put a mask on, you can come and go as you please, um, because there's no longer any scientific justification for any kind of collective behaviour. Um, I'm not exactly sure, and I need to research this on the statistics around um, how much the risk of infection is reduced by vaccination, but I think it's only 50% in the best trials. None, according uh, but, to the CDC's last study. Zero. They found that they carried the same amount of infection as everybody else in the latest published Oh, CDC. okay, right. Well, in that, could so you zero. send me that link? Because that's, that's interesting stuff. Um, yeah. I was going to say, even if it's 50%, it doesn't actually matter because we're all going to get it. So, you know, it, it's a pointless... I, I can't find, and I've been trying to find, the social benefit... If, if we have to give up our individual liberty and our individual freedoms and our individual civil liberties to wear a mask on our head on on national uh, podcast television, um, then why, why, what am I giving them up for? I only want to give them up if there's going to be some incredible collective benefit, right? A liberal country should not be giving up individual rights uh, unless there's a massive benefit. It's not just because, you know, a bunch of Karens in the bureaucracy said so. Uh, you have to have an argument. You have to have science. And yep. there's no, I, I, we got nothing back. The only thing that, that that came back when I put this out the other day on Twitter, uh, and I've asked everybody I've seen, the best argument I've heard for forcing everybody to get vaccinations, if you could say there's an argument for that, the best argument was, oh, well, it won't put too much pressure. It'll reduce the pressure on the hospital system. Well, well I'm sorry, but if you've taken 18 months to get your hospital system organised yep. simply to treat what will be about, 10,000, I mean, we're likely to get, you know, uh, there'll be 10,000 fatalities if that over, you know, it, assuming we had the same rate of infection as India, that's what we'd have. We'd have 10,000 fatalities. Now, do you think we're going to have as many fatalities as India? I don't. We've got a much better health system. We've got better, you know, whatever. Um, we don't have people crammed and living together. We don't have a, a massive poor population. So we're not going to have that many deaths. Now, if, if how many sick people are we going to have it simultaneously? That could be problematic, but you know, get some well, major hospital preventative off paid Do what the military do. You know, let's be really borrow clear. doctors from other countries. Do what let's you have be, to do as a wealthy nation. Let's be really clear. Our How rights are not a negotiation against the incompetency of politicians. So just exactly. because they, they didn't build enough hospitals or use the last 19 months now to put new hospital beds in doesn't give them the excuse to open up a discussion about taking away our rights and locking down citizens because they failed. That isn't how right, a rights system works, right? We're entitled to our rights regardless of the failures of politicians. And even starting up a conversation and agreeing to those terms of the conversation puts us in a, a terrible position to lose even more rights because we're almost accepting the premise, which is wrong. But what I also wanted to point on, on your Question thing, Damien. Here from right. Dixon. Wait, hang on. Let me just finish Damien's point. Um, you're right. They're using the collective benefit to get rid of individual responsibility and, and liberties, and that is socialism. Absolutely, yeah. straight up and down, it's socialism. And the only people being protected by it are them, their political careers, their bureaucratic seven hundred thousand dollar a year jobs. And before we finish, we've got to talk Dave's about... Dave's cracked. Look at him. He's gone. He's, we have to he's talk about the he's... Queensland CHO, but I want Dave to read this question on screen because it's funny. If you are unvaxxed, will you be able to vote? For now. For now. <laughs> I'm guessing instead of, uh, instead of proving your ID, 
you have to pass the drinking beer with a mask on test um, in Victoria. I, I'm pretty sure that you'll have to have a, a vaccine passport to vote in the very near future because the people who have been in, who've been locked in their houses aren't going to vote for the politicians who locked them up and, and took away their jobs. Yep. Can we talk about the the inimitable um, Jeanette Young, Dr. Jeanette Young? No, I'm not talking about Jeanette. No, I like Jeanette. Did you, did you see? Are you kidding? Little... No, I didn't. What did What did Jeanette do? Okay, now. please watch. The last episode of The Other Side Australia, episode 61, which uh, starts with Jeanette having a meltdown. Uh, she was asked at a press conference last week whether she was, um, you know, how many deaths she would be happy with. And then the second question was, you know, you're making political decisions. Why are you making political decisions? <laughs> and... Uh, well, your cup's not going to get COVID now. Just get through it, Damien. Just pretend it's a small <laughs> child or an animal. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Anyway, so when she was asked, look, I can, I can the first ignore question, she said, please remember who I am. I'm a doctor. I don't want any death, which is fair enough if you're a doctor, right? But not if you're the chief health officer who's supposed to be advising on a whole range of variables that can cause public health issues, all right? So, you know, that just shows how how single vision they are and how they're not taking into consideration other things. It's not her job to make policy either. She's supposed to advise the Premier who's supposed to make the response, who take the responsibility. But yep. like our Prime Minister, our Premiers are all responsibility allergic as well, to use your phrase, Alexandra. And that is yeah, the Yeah, Gladys Burge can actually don't want to take any responsibility because they, don't want to, they hide behind the CHO. I'll do whatever the CHO says. So when it all stuffs up, I can say... It was a set. I mean, that's exactly yeah, how the Chinese man. government works. Yeah, you know, she it's all about Gladys, who's the Gladys, full guy. Well, Gladys it's actually how she campaigned. Said. At every every campaign against Campbell Newman and the one afterwards, uh, she has campaigned. And every major question, uh, like, what are you going to do about this major policy area? She's like, oh, we'll form a working committee. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have any ideas, but we'll workshop it and we'll do some polling and uh, we'll, we'll figure out what our policy is after you elect us. Who's who's less competent, your Jeanette Young or Brett Sutton, who's revealed to be about as qualified as your general intern behind the desk? Sluggate. Yeah, well, yeah. And I haven't heard that one. <clears throat> hey, we yeah, haven't um, talked about the High Court decision. Oh, hey, uh, yeah. I'm just going to do a little promo for the next show on The Good Source starting in a couple of minutes. And if you guys want, we can do a little bit of overtime because we're having so much fun and there's so many questions about the that haven't been answered. And I definitely haven't got enough bacteria in this face nappy just yet. Um, so at 8 o'clock on The Good Source, you need to tune in because, well, this show is clearly not very serious. Um, and uh, we've got... Uh, What's his name? Actually, forgotten right now. Um, anyway, really great show coming up. Oh, <laughs> at, my at, God. Look, Topher Field. It suddenly came back to me. Sorry, I've been suffering from oxygen deprivation. I get that. Those long. mental blanks on people's names. <laughs> Topher Field is on at 8 p.m. on the Good Source Facebook page, uh, and he is interviewing in a slow chat, which no doubt will have whiskey and cigars, uh, Dr. John Humphreys, uh, who is the founder and president of the Liberal Democrat Party, uh, certainly one of your viable alternative options uh, when you think independently and don't vote for the major parties in the coming federal election. Um, Ellie, tell us about the High Court decision today. This is truly scary. So today, the High, or not today, yesterday, the High Court upheld its previous ruling that anybody with a social media account, be they a news corporation, a community business, uh, or you know, a politician, a public figure, or just an ordinary person, you will now be liable for the third party comments made on your page by anonymous trolls. So that means if someone says something defamatory about somebody else on your page, you are the one who will be taken to court and uh, fined or imprisoned for defamation, even though you have no control over who posts them and you have no control uh, over deleting them on many of these platforms. Now, this all came out of a ridiculous court case uh, 
against Sky News, at, not, not Sky News, News Corp and uh, Nine, I think it was, when there were comments posted on their Facebook page, which were defamatory. Now, they didn't have any ability to remove those comments. They didn't even know anything about them being there. And the court ruled that they participated in defamation even though they had no control over them. That was the ruling. That's what was upheld. And the ruling wasn't specific to news companies, so it extends to everybody. And my my first thought was I should really set up an anonymous account and go on Kevin Rudd's page and post defamatory comments about Murdoch and see what happens because I'd love to see Kevin Rudd uh, taken to it court. Would, um, yeah. It would be a shame. It would be a terrible shame if hundreds of millions of uh, uh, ultra fanatics around the world started posting on left-wing news sites uh, all kinds of things that might get them in trouble if they actually said it. Um, it would, yeah. I mean, this this law is unenforceable. It's a very very bad law. It sounds this like one of these time. situations where the court's been bound to make a decision on legal, on rule of law or something, and, and it's it's got to be. I mean, that's just absurd extension of This is the first time a law has actually allowed completely innocent people <clears throat> to be charged for the crimes of others. And I must add, it comes in the wake of the Australian Federal Police have just been handed extraordinary powers to pursue online anonymous accounts. And instead of going after the anonymous commenters who actually post the content, they want to go after the people who have no control over it and who did not publish it. But the one thing I raised at the bottom of the article, which I think is very interesting, I'd love to hear your opinion, is that this breaks the social media model. If people can't comment without fear of being sued, then they're just going to shut the comment sections of their social media posts down, yeah. which means that yeah. social media itself, there's no point to social media if you can't comment, right? That's it. So Silicon Valley will have to go to court to defend their own business model but in doing so, they'll have to prove that they are platforms and not the publishers of the third party content or they themselves will be liable for it. And considering how much editorial behavior they've exerted lately, I think they'll have a hard time trying to defend their business model and not end up being classified as publishers. What do you guys yep. think? Yeah, I think it's obscene. Um, first of all, how can you possibly um, have any law that uh, convict somebody for the crime of somebody else. Um, secondly, don't we have laws that protect the online platforms and protect big tech uh, from being uh, treated like a publisher? Section um, 230 and, immunity. Yeah. Um, and, and now we're, you're saying that people like us who run, you know, channels or whatever or programs, if we have comments and the commenters are uh, defamatory, um, then we're responsible for that. Well, that's like saying, and if it's, as you say, the first a five-year-old child would say, well, obviously that means I can go onto anybody's I don't like's side uh, <laughs> yep. age and make defamatory comments and then they're going to get into trouble for it. Under an anonymous that actually name. happened to me when I posted the article. That was the first thing that people did when they saw the article. They went onto my Twitter account and made, and it was joking, they were good-natured. Defamatory comments on the article itself because it, humans are like, let's take the piss. That's all humans do. And so this is a massive red flag saying, have a go. It's never it's never going to work. The, the thing Absolutely. is the High Court yeah, is actually... Just... Sorry, Dave. Jump the, in. the thing is the High Court is actually late to the game. Um, this, this is actually old news. Uh, all they're doing is putting some unfortunate formality uh, and credibility to the kangaroo courts uh, that go on in New South Wales. The New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Tribunal has already been receiving complaints lodged by one vexatious litigant who posted his own comments on Bernard Gaynor's website and then complained about his comments on Bernard Gaynor's website as vilifying homosexuals and then had the complaint received, accepted and proceeded and taken seriously, causing Bernard Gaynor to have to defend himself with lawyers and barristers and immense amounts of his family money. The it's law in literally. this area has been a joke for a long time on the Liberal government's watch. It's digital Smollett, you know, we can now... Uh, make up our own crimes against ourselves. But what are you supposed to do when someone sends you a death threat online? Can you sue yourself for the anonymous death threat on your own account? I don't understand. Like, this, it, there's no uh, 
uh, rationale for this, but what about groups like the Mad Epping yeah. Witches? Can you imagine what they're going to do to wow. uh, publications they don't like? Yep. Yeah, it, it's, it's insane. And also, just I insane. just don't know how long we can go on as a culture and a society with this kind of constant degradation of public trust in our most fundamentally important institutions. And I think yep. the entire Australian legal, on a serious note, the entire Australian legal fraternity needs, and, and there's a, an equivalent gender appropriate <clears> word for women equal to a fraternity, please use it. Um, but I think we've got to look at, you know, the entire profession sitting down and saying, what, what are we doing to protect uh, public trust in the institution, in our legal institutions? When we see what's going on in the courts in Victoria, and we see the High Court having to overrule the Supreme Court of Victoria on the most fundamental aspects of law that, that I mean, the politicization uh, and the use and misuse of the police force, this is all bad stuff. And I think yep. the only answer, guys, is, as you said, this has to be the election where we all put a minor party first. Doesn't Absolutely. matter which minor party, well, it does, make sure it's not the Greens. Um, but you know, right wing, of whatever course, minor party, government minor party or independent, you, you got to do it. We got to do it. We've got to send the message in one election, and this is the election to send the message that we're not copying this, this, this monolith yep. of lib lab nonsense and this massive bureaucracy that's yep. running this country into the ground. It's just a we've just become a technocracy, a big Robin problem. Is we need to halve our public service, we need to halve, we need to get rid of nine tenths of our laws we're too we're too over governed too over regulated we need to clean australia up or it's just not going to survive into the next sort of phase of its uh, of its existence the only reason we're still surviving now is we're resource rich if we weren't yeah. resource rich we'd be finished is, is, this, is this stupidity from the court though like is this basically coming about because our courts and our judges do not understand the subjects that they are making rulings on are we allowing ignorance to guide our legal system or are they deliberately trying to kill freedom? I think, like, reading the ruling, I thought they were just stupid. They didn't seem to understand how social media worked at all. I think they're restricted in what they can... The High Court is restricted in what it can do. It can only rule on the... Um, look, it's complicated, but, I mean, it can't, it can't change the fundamental ruling of the lower court on the facts. It can only look at the legality overall or something. So I'm going to get... Uh, try to get... Gillian Dempsey, the Queensland barrister, to come back on uh, the other side, perhaps in the next week or two, and um, and, and maybe explain it all to us because it's uh, it's a bit confusing and a bit concerning. Okay, Dave, really... we'll be quiet now. You can read your comment now, Dave. Yeah, Go this on. is very important. Um, Robin Gill, Robin Gill's question is: Why have you got a mask on? Um, and it's because I'm a good citizen. It's because. This is how you care for other people. It's um, important to make other people feel safe. Uh, and the science is very clear that um, masks are effective in making people feel safe. Um, it's 100% emotional support for you. And uh, as a responsible host and social media person, um, I understand the prevalence of computer viruses and I want you to be protected and, and feel safe. It's, it's really just about being a good Australian, uh, actually, uh, Robin, but thank you for your question. Well, we wouldn't internet... want you to catch a computer virus. No, no. Um, internet, 50, internet Guy 55 asks us all, uh, any idea why it's seemingly so hard to get a hold of the raw Australian COVID data with regards to separating case numbers, hospitalizations, deaths by vaxxed and unvaxxed. <laughs> the last thing the government has been in any state or federal level uh, is transparent. The last thing they want you to do is have information and data by which you might be able to hold them to account. Um, they would much rather that there be no dispute and no debate. Um, I'm actually going to just read a, a quote uh, from Richard Henry Lee, an American statesman and founding father from Virginia. And he says, it's natural for men who wish to hasten the adoption of a measure 
to tell us now is the crisis. Now is the critical moment which must be seized or all will be lost. And for them to then shut the door against free inquiry whenever conscious the thing presented has defects in it, which time and investigation will probably discover. This has been the custom of tyrants and their dependents in all ages. So that's why you can't get good COVID data uh, in Australia or probably many other places. Yep. And that's, you know, this is where I think we can turn it on them because I think we can apply that very same principle the other way around and say, this is the moment. This is the time above mm. all other times when we have to send a loud and clear message to the major parties just in one election, not vote for who we would normally vote for out of the major parties and say, I'm going to vote this time for a minor party. Look at the yep. minor party policies, make your own mind up which ones you prefer, Yep. Um, whether it's Liberal Democrats, whether it's Clive Palmer's United Australia Party, the UAP, whether it's um, Pauline Hanson's One Nation... I would so, rather. Um, yep. Um, I would. I would rather a handful of people from the motoring enthusiast party right now than um, most of the Liberal Party. Um, there are some good yeah, people. Yeah, I'm, I'm really concerned about what's happening to the Liberal Party. It's it's um, it's in a lot of trouble, and Is there I, I think really the Labor Party's scary? in a lot of trouble, and I think that they should be right now, frankly, for what he they've done. Here's the really scary thing: the, the major parties like Liberal and Labor want you to think that they're entrenched that your choices are only Liberal or Labor and that it's inevitable. But the fact is that the election slate is wiped clean every time we host an election and that if everyone votes for the same minor party, that minor party becomes government, whether they like it or not. And so your vote does matter. And uh, Damien's And I think right. what's unique about Australia, and they don't want us to understand the preferential voting system because they, they benefit from us not understanding it, but what's mm. great about the preferential voting system, there are a lot of things wrong with it, but what's great about the preferential voting system is you don't waste your vote. And I don't think enough people impossible. understand that. That's you right. It's vote. impossible to waste. Yeah, you cannot waste your vote. You can vote for yep. all the minor parties and then put your preferred major party next. And if those minor parties don't get the votes your preferred major party gets your vote. You actually yep. get to vote, and this is where I think it's wrong, but you actually get to vote more than once in the Australian system if you lose. It's a really, but only once it's a really bad um, system. There's a reason Westminster... Oh, I disagree it. entirely. I'm a huge fan. Huge no, fan. It, I don't know a better up. system. Oh, my God, Dave. I'm you're being so... Sarcastic. I know, I know you are. I know you are. But you're being sarcastic or you're being... Sarcastic. Because, no, I mean, people past. on both sides of politics have different views on this. It's... Uh, tricky one. I, yeah, I think well, anybody who major... doesn't like preferential voting just doesn't understand it. I used to love it and then I thought, hang on a minute, I get it now. The, the argument against it um, is not... that you're basically letting people vote multiple times. That's not true. The, the, basically what happens is you, you stop minor parties from ever getting power because as each minor party loses, the votes go to a major party essentially. And if major parties preference each other, then you'll never get a minor party in a small seat. It's really, it's that's why it was never part of the original system. But um, I, I just, I don't think it's. I mean, if if it's true that people get to vote multiple times, it's at best an emotional objection. Uh, no, I think look at a, the look at best a way of rate. finding out who, uh, of finding out how do we avoid the least representative candidates. No, let's put it this way. We're talking about merit. If you've got a horse race and one horse wins the race and then all the other horses get together and oh, pull their positions. No, listen, and let, the, no, let the last horse win. We're talking about the horse that won first is the horse that should have got through. So oh, that's the most emotional. People, emotional. It doesn't really help emotional. representation at all. You're is. getting less popular let, parties. You get people with a primary vote who lose. Let me give you a better metaphor. This this is instructive because there's so many people who have that flawed thinking, Alexandra. Not flawed. There's the people who set up the Winsemester system had hey, my listened, argument. I you're arguing against your... the people who founded the system you're trying to defend. I listened to your silly metaphor about You're not people. smarter than the people who wrote the Westminster system, Dave. Put your mask back on. You're wrong. We're not having a discussion. I'll write you an article. You can argue there. 
Oh, we're having it's this discussion. Just we're having this discussion. It's a brave man who faces <laughs> the wrath of Alexandra Marshall. No, no, we're, we're, we're no, doing no, no, this. No, I'm a young woman, so I'm not capable of standing up to male hosts. I just want to make that really clear. Yeah, no, we're there completely intimidating you. I, I, can, I can feel the amount of intimidation you're feeling because you're such I a weak, I can't possibly challenge Dave. Of femininity. <laughs> okay. No, I, it's not possible. The, no, the Dave, you've been told no. I'm asking those questions. voting works. <laughs> is if you have, uh, let's say, five candidates, uh, four candidates, and three of them are different types of family cars, uh, just to represent what different people are looking for. If you've got 15% uh, of people... Um, this is already shit. This is already terrible. If you've got 20% of people who want the four... <laughs> get my whiteboard. <laughs> get your whiteboard. Can we have visual aids? You, you do just go yeah, hang on, on for, for a we're second. We're not going to let you have this one, Dave, because you're wrong. So we're going to give you a hell until you be quiet. This is we're the same whiteboard I did my famous uh, Donald on Trump's one the election here. calculation on. So it's profoundly, uh, it's very experienced at being completely wrong. Sorry, it's Alexandra, what were you saying? <laughs> ah, you don't have the button controlling mute. Oh, sorry about that, Ellie. So I can get my <laughs> metaphor out now. <laughs> Oh, this is awesome. This is so good. This is what they meant, Dave, about, you know, <laughs> men <laughs> abusing their power. <laughs> Sorry for the misogyny. It's latent. Okay. So the reason the horse analogy is just dumb, the horse race analogy doesn't work, is because it's not a horse race. What we're trying to figure out is what vehicle is best suited to the most person, not the first person to cross the line, but what type of government, what type of candidate, what type of policy set is best for everybody? So if I'm going to compare, let's say, family values to a family sedan in a metaphor and uh, fierce authoritarianism to a Harley Davidson uh, motorbike, if you've got one candidate who gets 45% uh, of the vote, the Harley Davidson candidate, and everybody else uh, gets you know, splitting the rest, the, the 55% uh, in, in family sedan type um, parties, then what you're actually having in your vote is you see that 55% of people say that a Harley Davidson single authoritarian kind of government is the worst possible outcome. And the best thing for them is a family values type of vehicle for government. But if you have this first-past-the-post rubbish nonsense, then you're going to have 55% of the people entirely discontented with the type of government and government policies that you end up with, but at least you feel emotionally satisfied about uh, the first-past-the-post being the winner. That is so wrong. The idea is the whole point of politics is you have parties competing for one day for one election and you get one vote. And the party which convinces people with their one vote is the party that's meant to win. In your system of government, Dave, you can have the Labor Party preference the Greens and you can have the Liberals get the most first past the post. Parties don't create preferences. You, no, listen to me. Preference. You can get the Liberals win first past the post. So you've got a Liberal majority in your seat. But the losers, the left, can then come through and put a party like the Greens in and so the majority who wanted the Liberals to win end up Those being... Those are parties in government. Parties but they don't control but preferences. You get a That's completely a different system of government. With If you take away first past the post, you empower the left. And we've seen it. And not only that, you get parties becoming more like each other. Today's system, it only took about 20 years. Our politics have fallen off a cliff since we brought in preference voting, like we have now. We saw the decline of political integrity start almost exactly when preferencing began because it ruined the role of minor parties. That minor argument parties may not be without merit. Minor I, parties lost their ability to win seats, and so we lost our mechanism to hold major parties to account. And that's why the Westminster system never allowed it to start with, because they knew what would happen and what the natural consequence would be. And now we've got to live with it. We've got to live with the problem. Isn't supposed to help minor parties win, though? No, it, do it doesn't. So minor parties can win first past the post. They're able to win. But if major parties preference each other, minor parties can't win the seat unless they have a massive, massive majority. So it's taken away this slim opportunity for a minor to take power off a major, and they, when you've got the major okay, backing each other, look, I'm, I'm thinking about my state seat of Maywa in Queensland, in Brisbane, um, where we have the only Green MP, Michael something, Beckworth or something, um, Beckman, Berkman. Um, so 
he got in because um, he got the Labor Party preferences. He pipped Labor That's my by point. just a he, tiny he's, bit. He's like he a got national all their preferences. Party. He's and he like beat coalition. Scott Emerson, but Scott Emerson won first past the post. This is my point. The Greens are acting in a coalition with Labor, so that's what I'm saying. You have someone who should have won. But there's an example of a minor of party getting up, though. No, but it's not a minor party. They're like a coalition. The Greens are a special relationship like the Nationals are to the Liberals. They're basically a firm coalition, so they don't act like a true independent minor party that has to sort their own preferences out each time. They, they really should be an official they coalition. They cross-preference each other all the time? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty much a firm. They call it a firm coalition, and so they really should have been redone. And this is a boring conversation. We should pretty much move to a different topic. Do you have a I, better I, topic? I still think you're, oh, you're think wrong in your conclusion. You got some valid points, Ellie, but you know your your language is emotional. Like the libs uh, preferencing the labors and stuff like that. Parties don't get preferences. If that's what the voters are stupid enough to put down on their um, ballot then that's the voters getting their will. Now, the way to improve that system is to help voters to be better educated. I think that's why I know, that's why I do what I do, and I hope that's why you guys do what you do. It's to help make voters smarter so they can stop taking the how to vote cards of other people, telling them how to vote, telling them how to preference uh, other people. It's really easy. I mean, you said it before, every election is a blank slate. We can totally change the slate uh, totally change the parliament at any given election. We just need enough of us people awake enough to do it. I hope the next federal election is part of it. And part of what we have to do in that is teach people how preferences work. Not everything that's wrong with the system, but how to make the system work that we have as good as possible and to its fullest extent. And the reason I love the preferential system is because it is so powerful for us to make the worst of the major parties right down the bottom. The only reason it doesn't work is because not enough of us do it. That is democratic. There's a whole bunch of people who are really happy with the major party duopoly. And I hate that, but it's the same people who are happy with wearing masks, putting, telling the government where they are every second of the day and injecting whatever the government tells them to. These are people who love big government. That's our mission to change. It's not a fault of preferential voting. It's the fault of public education, if anything. My last point is going to be that the proof of who's right and wrong is in this, what's happened to our political system since we brought in preferential voting, which is exactly what the people who made the system said would happen if it were allowed, and that is the complete destruction of party integrity and the movement of major parties into a solitary monetary uh, mono party. And they were right. As soon as preferencing voting came in, the minor parties lost out and we ended up with a mono government. And so yep. I rest my case on the evidence of what actually happened. That's, that's it. Do you have Jamie, a question I'm there? I'm going to call on everybody to Ellie's make sure that they understand the system and that, that you know, mm -hmm. that you just know that you can vote for all the minor parties and put them first and then put your preferred major party at the bottom and then put the other parties, minor and major, that you don't like after that, and your vote will still, if it doesn't count for those minor parties you put at the front, it will count for your major, your preferred major party because it will go through those cycles. So, you know, it's 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 Lib Dems, One Nation, Liber LMP, Liberal Party, whatever, um, and then, you know, Greens, Labor, whatever you want to put the rest yep. of it. But... If you're a conservative or you're on the right, on the centre right, that's that's how you would be looking at doing it. If you're um, if you're Alexandra, it'd be One Nation Lib Dems. I'm not going <laughs> to sort of speak for you, Dave. But uh, well, hey, Dave's no been, going for yet. Dave's been excluded. He hasn't got his vaccine passport for voting, so it doesn't matter anyway. I haven't got my mask on. I like the Lib Dems because it's the people from the Liberal Party. So they've had a little bit more government. I mean, people like Campbell Newman in Queensland, where you've got a someone running for the Senate who actually has run government. The guys run, you know, two city councils. In How the state frightened government. are they of Craig Kelly? Craig Kelly has scared the living oh, heck. And Campbell. They, they're frightened. Of, mate, they're terrified. You know what they're doing to the Liberal Democrats? They're trying to get, they put this law through to say, oh, you can't use the word liberal in your name. Well, I saw, no, but I saw that law. So I actually tried to report this law. It's not the case. Liberal is one of the words that's excluded from that legislation. So you're not allowed to own words like liberal, free, Australia, none of those words. What they did, which is destructive to minor parties, 
is they uh, lower, sorry, they uh, made the minimum membership higher. So it went from 500 to 1,500 members. So I was confused as to why the uh, Lib Dems were complaining about their name because on the actual legislation, the name was not an issue for the Liberal Democrats. The Liberals can't object to the word liberal uh, inside the legislation. But the party membership is a problem. Uh, that's why it's interesting that Craig Kelly has gone straight through that. He's got enough members that it's not going to matter because the membership's free. So it was an attempt by the two major parties to stop minor parties coming up, um, yeah. and they kind of failed because free membership, people will sign up. Psychedelic has perhaps the uh, worst suggestion of the night. Senator Marshall. Okay, I'm just being mean. Like a the team. first thing I'm going to do is, is I'm suggestion. going to press Dave. Uh, I'm going to press you, Dave. Uh, I'm going to make sure that you can't speak. I'm going to take your platform down and uh, hire Damien to troll your accounts to make sure that you get taken to court for various... I'm going to fundraise for you. It sounds like great. <laughs> See, all the Nazis are on the right after all. There you go. We're just, it's just a, we're like the left. We've got this suppressed authoritarianism. As soon as we get power, it's going to come out. I'm going to be after you, Pello. That's, that's going down. I like Damien and I have formed, we've formed an, an unofficial coalition on this panel. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it's going to work out well for us. I'll run for the Lib Dems if you run for One Nation. Yeah. Done. And I'll... Um, <laughs> Dave's like, crap! That'd be I funny. I lost complete control of this show. And I'll... Um, uh... <laughs> I just realised that Dave's been wearing his mask wrong all night. He's now worked out the blue goes on the outside, not the inside. But I'm pretty sure that before, earlier on the program, the white was on the outside because he's a white supremacist. I've never of all the ways that. I've been wearing it all night, your problem is with which colour was on the outside. <laughs> Only because I walked around the shops for a good month wearing it the wrong way. Oh, my God. <laughs> a friend of mine got me this from Utah. I like what it does one. to your ears, Damien. It, just, it really yeah, pushes your ears no. out. They all do that to my ears. That's why I don't wear them. <laughs> anyway. I at, least you guys, at least you don't wear lipstick because when I wear masks, I just get this veneer of lipstick across the front. It's... Uh, it's really hygienic. Also, my nose is too big for the mask as well, which is great. Okay, so Kylie Kearns asks, how can we show support without being seen as extremists that are breaking orders? Uh, well, Kylie, my first recommendation is don't worry about how you're seen. Um, it's, I mean, yeah, the, the, the fact is that uh, you're already hated, you're already despised, you're already... Um, marginalised and vilified by everybody who disagrees with you. Um, I don't know that you've got anything less left to lose. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's a sad state of affairs, but um, certainly by the very fact of your disagreement, they lose all respect for you. Um, they're not in the least bit interested in sincere or civil debate. Uh, in fact, I think the only strategy that's workable for changing the mind of those people who've been brainwashed by the government propaganda uh, is emotionalism. I think we just, and I'm very serious, I know I've been silly all night, but I'm very serious about this. We have to show the damage that government policy is causing to human lives, uh, to mental health, uh, to, to family businesses that have been in generations uh, that people have risked their family homes on, uh, the the people that are desperate about how they're going to uh, house and feed their families when they r lose their job because they can't provide informed consent uh, for the vaccination. And these are the stories that we need to show to politicians and to our friends uh, because they think they are actually being compassionate and caring. And that is the strength that we have to speak to uh, if we want to change their mind, because they're not listening to the science, they're not listening to the Constitution, and they're not listening to the moral arguments of fundamental human rights. They think the ends justify the means, and they think that they're helping. And the only way to change their minds is to show them the hurt that they're causing. Hey, Krishna. That's worked up till now, though. What did you say, Damien? You know. Hey, Dave got his show back. 
It's not my show. It's the people. We're just Damien show. and I are just having a breather. That's all. We're just uh, regaining strength. Hey, Damien, I just promised realize. I'd let you go by eight o'clock. Are you okay? I know, man. I have got to go. I have a family out there that I've got to, got to spend some time with. Meanwhile, I, I've been locked in here for so long in Sydney that I'm starting to look more and more like a vampire. I've just realised that I'm so pale now that my eyes are going really blue and I look like some kind of undead uh, murderer, essentially, which is a great look. Great look indeed. Don't show my house Especially to the world. Again, Who did Dave? that? Who put me on widescreen? Stop it. Bastards. That's the whole <laughs> house. That's the whole early tour of the house. That's it. Wasn't me. Hands free. Uh -huh. Awesome. Well, no, guys, no, um, you. you're going to let people go watch Tofa. Yeah, look, you're going to have to watch it on replay if you're still watching and make sure you do. Mind you, he's probably going for two or three hours. When he says slow chat, he really means slow chat. Uh, if he's Michael got my name for on, he'll be going for a couple of hours, especially if they're drinking yeah. scotch and smoking cigars. It'll yeah, be yeah, definitely. Um, that's that's a thing that's happening. Um, look, I, I just want to put a little plea out there that the Liberal Party does need to be saved um, because it's so hard to educate so many people uh, how to, you know, get, use preferential voting. We actually do need people to stay in the Liberal Party as members and a whole lot more people to join it, not to be seen as some kind of endorsement, not to be seen as some kind of personal support. Please don't donate or vote for them above sensible candidates. Um, but do be in the party machine for the sake of helping that party machine better represent people like you. Um, be there as an influence and operate wholly within the constitution and uh, ethical framework that the party sets out uh, that it needs for members. Um, but yeah, do, do it the right way. Um, this is a long game. The long march through the institutions isn't something uh, we can give up on in one election cycle um, or even uh, one decade for that matter. Uh, they've been doing it for yeah. yeah, they've been doing it for 70 years and yeah. um, we really have to uh, figure out how we can walk and chew gum at the same time, support better candidates and help change the, the, um, the, the best option of major parties. Um, so... Yeah, final thoughts from uh, you, Ellie Melly. Politics is a narcissistic endeavour. And at the end of de the day, the fastest way to rebuild something like the Liberal Party is to not vote for them unless your individual member supports your rights and goes against vaccine passports. And I guarantee you it'll basically take the party to be torn apart, get rid of all the seat warmers and the people who are only in it for the position, take those positions from them. Don't let them have the pensions. Don't let them have their comfy seats. Take it all from them. And then the only people who will be left are the people who truly believe in conservative values. And then they will run in the next election and you will have a party back that looks like a conservative party. But while ever you continue to vote for the Liberals, while they abuse your human rights, while they lock you out of society, and while ever they think they can get away with it because they're not as bad as Labor, you will have a party that looks more and more like a radical left-wing Marxist outfit than a conservative party. So in politics, it sounds harsh, but you have to burn it to the ground if you want it to be rebuilt with anything that looks like a decent party. And that is the fastest way through yep. this mess. Sad but true. Damien Curry. Um, well, same. I think I, I think that we've got to ask ourselves, um, where is the where is the party? Where is the party that protects liberalism and everybody from the, the center to the to the right has got to say look we need a strong opposition in states where we have these crazy authoritarian bureaucratic labor governments we need a very good federal government to show a spine and show some leadership and um, slap around premiers when they do ridiculous hopeless destructive things like put a border between you know right down the middle of a city uh, mm. and, and destroy people's lives. Those images of people meeting across those orange oh, barricades has to be the most absurd image I've yeah. ever seen in my life. Of any any country that can afford to do that is a very wealthy, but bloody stupid country, badly led yes. by a bunch of losers. And that's it's, where we are right now. The only way to fix it is to send a very strong message. The only way to send that message is to hit those minor parties and vote for those minor parties. Uh, and then hopefully that will have the impact we want it to have on the Liberal Party. Someone put a very good comment on there just before that uh, the problem with the Liberal Party is it's been taken over by the young Liberals. I My very brief stint um, in that party and, and sort of trying to understand that party last year, 
uh, and early this year. Uh, I would have to say I, I, I would concur with that. I think the young liberals are further left than 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 they should be, and um, and that they have too much control, too much power. There's too many career yeah. political career seekers operating in the party in the major parties, and we yep. have to knock them out with people who actually care about the country, uh, yeah. like Campbell Newman, um, like Craig Kelly, like Pauline Hanson, people who actually. And mm. I don't agree with 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 a lot of what some of those people say, uh, but they care. They're coming from the right place, you yeah. know, which is that they care about the country. They're not coming from I want to be a politician. I want to have a political career. Um, so you know that's mm. what we've got to vote for. We've got to vote for people who actually who actually care and who actually have the right. And, and it's really important, guys, to volunteer for those candidates as well. Um, they're going to need yes. an, an army of people at the polling booths because of the way this, the, the, the infrastructure around preferential voting has been set up to manipulate um, people who aren't strong independent thinkers into voting the way the parties want them to vote. And while the parties don't have a vote or preferences, uh, they certainly have the power to change unthinking people's preferences into what they would prefer. Uh, you know, for example, the Labor Party regularly rails against One Nation as if voting for them is like voting for Adolf Hitler. And, and of course, you would put the Greens uh, above them. And the Liberal Party then uh, dances to the tune being played by by the Labor Party when, in, in fact, One Nation is far more conservative and traditional in their values, including liberty, uh, than the Liberal Party. And shame on the Liberal Party for that being true. Well, one... One Nation has a has a policy for free speech, which is why the Liberal Party doesn't like them. You can't have a, a party for free speech and have a Liberal endorsement, can you? That goes against everything Scott Morrison's up to. But to your point, Damien, the reason you've got politicians like that is because we pay them too much money. Before in Australia, when politics was a, a, a modest career at, or no pay at all, but when it was modest, you got people who were there because they believed in what they were doing. It's hard work and they, they actually wanted to make a difference. But now yeah. people are chasing politics because it's a way to earn a lot of cash and it's a stepping stone on the international bureaucracy seats where they just want to have a position on the UN and that's all they're thinking about. They don't care about the country. Yep. 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 And and, uh, and you're right about, you know, Scott Morrison dancing to the tune or letting the agenda be set by, and we saw it happen in the Queensland election, we saw it happen in the West Australian election, it didn't work for them and they're still going to make the same mistake again and do it again. And they're going to be out on their ear, um, yep. and they haven't got it. And that's why I've left, you know, walked away from the Liberal Party because I just think it's it's, it's it's if they haven't learned that lesson by now, I'm not going to sit around and fight another election and lose. Um, so you know, I'm throwing my way yeah. behind the Lib Dems, you know, because I think they, you know, I think they they've got the right getting the right team together and have got the right policy and the good. Pretty good COVID policy. Um, okay, on, on okay. No, no promo speeches for political parties. No, you can here. promo away. Promo away. Come on, you've done your One Nation thing. God, right, I'm right now, to say it. right <laughs> now, I think uh, there's a couple of questions in in the comments here uh, about which is the better party of the two. My strong advice to you is Clive. put all of them above <laughs> the major parties. One Nation, Clive Palmer. Uh, yeah. uh, Lib Dems, uh, who are we forgetting? Uh, Great Australian Catter? Party. Don't forget Catter. You can't forget Catter. Catter. He's got to go. He's got to go Catter. above the Greens. I mean, you, you name it, put them all above the major parties, anybody except the Greens. Um, and your independents you have to scrutinise very carefully because some of them are sneaky lefties. Um, but you, all of your minor right-wing parties, put them above all all of the major parties and left-wing parties, but I repeat myself. Um, and that is, you, it, it actually then doesn't super matter that much if you get it slightly wrong, Lib Dems, One Nation, One Nation, Lib Dems, or, or those. As long as they all go above the major parties, we have the best chance possible. Look, I, I think all of them are essentially going to be for a smaller government than the Liberal Party is, and, and that's the best thing we can hope for for our nation right now. But the next thing we can hope for is that enough of those small guys get into the Senate and the government, the parliament, so that uh, we actually slow down the machine of legislation and they stop being able to churn out so much. The best and thing. And let's go for the, let's go for the, 
you know, someone just says it's mathematically impossible if they don't start supporting each other. Well, yeah, we're, obviously, I think the smaller conservative parties have got to swap preferences. Um, but it's up to you, the voter, right? You decide mm. what preference where preferences go. Swapping preferences and putting on a how to vote card, that's just a recommendation. You get to decide where the preferences go. Put yep. Do exactly as Dave said. Put them in the order you want to put them in. And yep. then, you know, and I think it's fair to say that... Um, you know, the, the, the Lib Dems, if you're a little bit more towards the centre, a bit more of a classical liberal like me, if you're more conservative, it might be One Nation or, uh, you know, the the the, uh, the Palmer Party or Catter Party or whatever. Mm -hmm. But just have a look at the candidates, meet the candidates, see if you like them. Yeah, who you please. Like, vote for who you like for. That's how it's supposed to work anyway. It's and then they'll get into Parliament. And if we get the balance of power in the Senate, which I think they will have, they might. we might even end up with a hung parliament and have balance of power in the House of Representatives. And I'm sorry, but I don't think that's going to be a bad thing for government. That's fantastic. I think fantastic. it's going to be a good thing for government, and it's going to send yep. the right message to the major parties, which we have to send after this. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. they in the... We've been through. This, the this entire parties... conversation is pointless because you're going to bring in Dominion voting systems and it doesn't matter what you vote. <laughs> well, now you're going to have uh, a conspiracy theory we've, we've, uh, hey, Queensland, uh, we've... your state, your state is doing after it. After 8.30, that's when the... The vampire I, stuff comes out. She goes right off the. I actually like, actually think we've talked into the conspiracy theories. Dominion. Vote. I'm hungry. Yeah. I want to go. We can talk about that we've, later. We've top and tailed with uh, the conspiracy theories tonight, and we've uh, perfectly satisfied uh, Christina Keneally. We started with New World Order. We're finishing with Dominion voting systems. We have, uh, you know, we don't want to be sued by the way. throughout <laughs> with wearing face masks. It's the trifecta. Yeah, it is the trifecta. I need to go hunting. It's like, you know, it's time. I All right. Go. Uh, let's play the outro music, Matt. It's time to say good night. 10th or 16th. I'm not sure. Oh, the lockdowns, etc. Look, it's uh, been fantastic. Um, just chatting and, and taking some questions, having a more relaxed night. It's kind of fun. Uh, it is good to have some serious content, though. Uh, catch up with uh, The Other Side Australia. Um, with Damien Curry and Alexandra Marshall, who's writing for The Good Source as well as Rebel News. And uh, tune into goodsource.news to subscribe to our newsletters and read serious articles. We'll see you next week. Today, we need a special kind of courage. Not the kind needed in battle, but a kind which makes us stand up for everything that we know is right, everything that is true and honest. We need a kind of courage that can withstand the subtle corruption of the cynic so that we can show the world that we're